I know what I saw. Nothing can compare. I have been a soldier in these Zahal for what feels like my entire life. When you grow up in a country surrounded by enemies on all sides, who want you dead at the mere sight of you, the military becomes an obligation. Hamas, the Muslim Brotherhood, Iran, Iraq, Jordan, Egypt, and even Lebanon. Name me a country we share a border with, or even share air with, and I can show you an enemy of the state of Israel. Why do they want us dead? For holding a small sliver of land others have abandoned long ago. Or is it hate? I will not get into this. I will just say, I was born here, and this is my home as far as I care, and I will defend it from all threats. But I fear I no longer can. The end began not too long ago. As a soldier, I am called to respond to many disturbances in Jerusalem. They may be something simple, as a family crossing a border without a passport or identification, and an altercation ensues. More often, it is something sinister, such as an attempted bombing, shooting, or another such attack. I am always ready, ready to die for my country and my fellow soldiers, ready to die for my faith, to uphold God's law. God's law, saying that now, after seeing what I've seen, what are those laws? How do you apply them to creatures of his own making? A Friday like any other, as far as I thought. I hoped to prepare for the Sabbaths beginning without incident when the report came over the radio. I have five armed individuals near the western wall. Please respond. The radio squad. David and Tamir infantry responding. My partner David said. I got into the passenger seat of our Humvee, as David stowed his 895 submachine gun in the back. I kept mine at the ready. Another beautiful day in the Holy Land, yes Tamir. David laughed. All we could do to keep from going mad is to make light of our daily tasks. The Holy Land, we told ourselves Israel is our land all the time, but it never felt like it. This land is mine. God gave this land to me. Muslims believe the same thing. Both of us willing to die for it. Was it worth it? I saw a pair of helicopters flying overhead. They were responding with us. American made choppers of course. We designated them as Saros. I forgot what the Americans called theirs. I wonder what merited this much firepower. The Seraphs were fighters, armed to the teeth. I wondered, is this it? Is this the Muslim invasion? Is this the end? I was half right. As I watched the choppers fly overhead, one let loose a Stinger missile. It made little sense to me because Stingers are an air-to-air -air ordinance. In the air, I spotted something flying right towards it. Not an aircraft, but too slow for a missile. My eyes widened as I finally recognized it. It's a woman. She's not in a plane, only wearing white armor. It glistens in the sunlight. As I inspected her, I couldn't believe my eyes. White wings, like an angel's. She dodged the stinger missile and then reached down to her back, drawing some kind of huge sword. Without another moment, she crashed into the cockpit, sword first. The Seraph dropped altitude, and soon she ripped through the aircraft, plowing straight through it, exiting out of the tail end of the fuel lodge. Behind her, the wreckage of the chopper burst into flames as it falls from the air. But she kept going. This angel... This angel of death, I could say. She continued to the next chopper. She dove at it from the side this time, shoving her sword into the cabin, skewering whoever was inside. She almost appeared to be appraising the helicopter, 
Looking around inside, she pulled the pilot out, or part of him, and dropped him from the sky. Is she investigating the helicopter? Did the angel not understand our new technology? Did I lose my mind, or am I dreaming all of this? Is this a misunderstanding? Did she somehow think it is a creature of Satan? She soon took the helicopter downward, dipping it into a nosedive into the ground, and then back up as she manipulated the controls from outside. I soon drew my attention to the sight on the ground. Four people stood before a mass of soldiers. There was fire in the streets, as if someone had just detonated some incendiary device. I was in shock from what I saw in the air. I'm certain David had not seen it. His eyes on the road in flames before us. David got out of the Humvee and ran to join our brothers in arms. I still stared in veneration at the four people before us. Three wore a uniform. Two of them were women, one man. The male was bald, about 180 centimeters tall, long white sleeves and a black vest over it, with similar black slacks. His hands are bare, and he is standing back with another woman. This woman wears the same outfit. She stands much shorter, 150 centimeters, a thin thing, but her green eyes are wide with some kind of madness. Her hair is bright blonde and wild, her skin pale. And lastly is a woman, all the men have their guns pointed at, David included. He demands she shows him her hands. She's about the same height as the male, a centimeter or two taller. Her hair is blonde but her skin is darker. Rows of tight braids run over from the top of her head, swept behind and going down her back. She wears the same odd uniform as the others. But as they tell her to show her hands, she raises them out wide, her fingers spread. As she does so, arcs of electricity dance between her fingertips. Her eyes are closed at first, but when she opens them, they glow yellow and bright. She floated into the air, her feet delicately lifting off the ground, though I saw no wires or anything else that would explain what was lifting her into the air. As I look on, I nearly go blind. She shouted two words. Reshep Birik. Bursting forth from her body was a bright yellow light, and the smell of ozone filled the air. I grabbed my head and I dove into my seat as the glass of the Humvee's windshield shattered over me. After a moment or two, I rose out of the seat, grounded by the truck. I was the only survivor of the lightning that she had summoned. As the woman landed on the ground, arcs of electricity reached from the ground to the tips of her toes. She landed it daintily, looking at the corpses of my fallen brothers with little care. The madwoman shouted, Syria! Now how can I make their blood dance if you zap them all? She giggled. The woman, who I assumed was Syria, turned to the shorter girl and spoke in an old accent I could not place. Alexis, behave yourself before our master. You're as bad as Rasper. The male interrupted in a thick accent. Oi, I'm not as bad as a... Stifle yourselves, a male's voice spoke. Another man was behind them. He wore an outfit far different from the others. He was wearing a brown uniform with dark purple epaulets with short gold tassels attached. Brass buttons ran up along his right breast before the side of the uniform took a turn and met at the other side of his collar. He wore no marks of honor or medals. Brass buttons were on the cuffs of his uniform though his right hand was clad in a leather glove that had a golden claw wrapped around it. Of course, master. The mad woman who was clearly Alexis said in a sing-song sort of manner. As she said this, I realized what I had to do. I jumped out of the car, took aim at the master, and I opened fire. I unleashed a hail of bullets and I know that I was hitting him, 
I was certain that I was, but he didn't seem to react as I would expect. The golden gauntlet reached out towards me, and as it did, my eyes went wide in horror as my bullets stopped just before his hand. The bullets shook and rattled in the air in time with his hand. I could hear the metal of the gauntlet creaking and groaning as he somehow prevented the bullets from striking him. Some kind of strange violent translucent dome protecting him. His eyes, those ice blue piercing eyes, I will never forget them, glared back at me with hatred. They narrowed at me as he closed his fist and then thrust it towards me. Every bullet I fired flew back at me. One bullet struck me in the leg, another in my shoulder, with enough power to force me to the ground. I feigned death, falling to my knees and then flat on my chest, doing my best to keep my eyes half opened and my breathing to a minimum. Well, that was disappointing, Rasper spoke. He had a beat on you, Master. Syria, you missed one. The master spoke, glaring. The car protected him. Syria protested. It's a metal frame. It must have grounded him. Alexis whined. And I still can't play with his blood, now can I? Rasper then turned around as another group of men came from a different alleyway. I watched in shock as fire engulfed his hand and he shot flames from it, burning the men alive. It seems we knocked the hornet's nest a bit there, master. Should we level the place? The angel woman from before landed next to the other four, her huge wings closing behind her. She was a mountain of a woman, massive, towering, and frightful. Rachel isn't here. If this is the world's most important city, Rachel's not the queen. She had an alto voice, but not the deep thunking grunts I'd expect from her. She glanced around. Which is peculiar. The master chuckled. Perhaps she was overthrown. The woman glared at him. Do not make light of such things, brother. Now that I was closer, I could see her hair was in a long white braid on one side of her head and shaved on the other side. She had violet eyes and her armor was an off-white light color. Despite this, it almost sparkled in the light, like a precious gemstone. Like she wore armor made of quartz. We'll investigate this place and compare it to the others. In the meantime, I have delivered our message. We are here, their master said. And with that, the five of them all turned and walked into some strange doorways I could barely make out. Once they were all gone, I sat up, reaching for my radio. Men down, western wall, send an ambulance, I'm critical. I heard someone answer on the other end, but I couldn't make out what they said. I don't know if it was blood loss or shock, but I was losing consciousness. The next thing I knew, I was in a hospital bed, a senior officer sitting next to me making sure that he was the first person that I spoke with. Tamir, how are you feeling? He asked. I groaned. Not well. I sat up. Please tell me, was I dreaming? The senior officer looked at me. We need to get a statement of what happened. You're the only survivor. We lost two airborne units and five units on the ground. Without warning, all the screens in the room turned on. The television in the corner, my monitoring equipment, even my personal cell phone all powered on, playing a single video. The video was of the man from earlier, the master sitting on a bridge of some sort of ship. To me, it looked like an aircraft carrier or something. His thin lips parted in a bit of a sick grin as he began to speak. Ye have been judged and found wanting. He began. Citizens of Terra, your day of judgment has arrived. Ye seem to pause for effect. The officer in the room shouted. Find out where this is coming from. That's him, I said, pointing to the screen. 
the man that attacked us. He had four others with him. They called him Master, I explained. God has attempted to guide your pathetic race for millennia to no avail. He sent you commandments that you have ignored, prophets that you have mocked, and finally sent you his own son. He leaned back in his chair. Whom you killed. As he says this, the massive woman from before comes into the frame. She still wears the quartz-like armor, though without the sunlight now, it only appears as coarse-looking white stone. It's an off-white, trimmed in simple silver or maybe even polished steel. I can see she has violet eyes, which struck me as very odd. As she sits next to the man, her wings come into the frame. Huge white, feathery wings, which she seems to pull in tight against her back. She's taller than the master, even sitting, which is surprising. The woman leaned back in her chair as the man began to rant again. You've continued to kill in the name of God for thousands of years. Now it ends. I shall allow these travesties no longer, he continues. Salvation is yours. You only need to swear fealty to your new savior, Zyphiel. He motions to himself. The woman to his right speaks. Or be destroyed by Ragna. It's your choice. And the screen went black. I'm still staring at the blank screen when my officer demands to know what I know of them. I describe what happened, but I am in a daze. Zyphiel is the harbinger of the end times. Of this I am certain. This man, if you can call him that, will bring about our doom. May God have mercy on all of us.